How does this song is Little Moses? I learned from, from my grandmother when I was very small. The traditional styles of music were preserved and reshaped during the 19th century and created folk, blues, and country during the early 20th century. It was during this time that several notable Arkansas musicians were born. One that carried the beacon of folk music was James Jimmy Driftwood Morris. His father, Neil Morris, was a musician and had carried on the tradition from his father and grandparents. Well, when I was just a small boy, they said that music grew like the grapevine that is never pruned. Here this infant was lonely and sad. She took him in pity and thought him so pretty, which made little Moses so glad. She called him her own. This is Neil Morris. He was my grandfather, and he is the father of Jimmy Driftwood. My grandfather in uh, 1888, he would play the banjo and he would play the guitar, and that's mostly what he played. His father was John Stephen Morris, and John Stephen was a peddler. A peddler was a man that bought commodities and pots and pans and had this horse and buggy, and he'd start driving up down the road and these pans would be rattling and banging on them as he went. People would hear him come in and if they wanted a pot or a pan or if they wanted maybe salt, sugar, stuff like that, why well, he would have it on the buggy. And uh, he toured all over this part of the state. His songs, he picked up a lot from the people where he went, I'm sure. So far as the Morris family is concerned, we we traced it back for a little more than 500 years. That's as far as we could go. There's always been musicians in my family. My wife, Jimmy Driftwood's mother, was one of the best singers I ever heard sing. So Jimmy Driftwood gets his singing from both sides of the family. My folks played music and they, they sang, and I think I heard my mama singing before I was born. Others from the folk tradition include banjo players Ollie Gilbert and Book Miller Shannon, singers Almeida Riddle and Emma Dusenberry, and fiddlers Bob Larkin and Violet Brumley Hensley. Considered the father of rhythm and blues and a godfather of rap and known as the king of the jukeboxes in the 1940s, Louis Jordan was born in Brinkley in 1908. His father, James Jordan, was born in Dardanelle in 1876 and was the first instructor of the Brinkley Brass Band when he wasn't on the road touring with minstrel and medicine shows of the era. These shows were popular amongst black and white audiences alike and were often promoted using racist names or caricatures. He was part of, I think, the development of what they call the Rabbit Minstrel uh, Network uh, that occurred back in those days who actually helped to foster uh, up-and-coming musicians. They migrated all over the South doing music in nightclubs and things during that era. And somehow or another, he gravitated to Brinkley. When Louis was young, he began joining his father on the road, not yet to play, but to learn the life of a working musician. Louis and other younger players got early starts filling in for brass bands due to World War I vacancies. James Jordan was a taskmaster of a teacher who taught his son and his other students the value of rehearsal. Uh, Louis Jordan Sr. was a musical genius from my understanding. My great uncles were born around the same time that Louis Jordan was, was born, and they were all taught by Louis Jordan Sr. During that time, it was fairly upbeat music, so uh, I think Louis Jordan Jr. adapted his style from the South and from his father. From that rabbit minstrel period, there was a lot of upbeat music in the South. It was really jumpy. As a matter of fact, they call it jump music <clears throat> because it wasn't, it wasn't a dragon type music. It was really upbeat, up tempo. And as a result, Louis Jordan Jr. learned from his father that upbeat music. Less than 15 miles from where Louis Jordan was born, Sister Rosetta Tharp was born in Cotton Plant and with her flamboyant lead guitar technique has become known as the godmother of rock and roll. 
uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp was born Rosetta Newbin in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, March 20th, 1915. Her parents were Katie Bell Newbin and Willis Atkins. Her mother was a Church of God in Christ minister, and that's how she gravitated here. She and her mother stayed here until she was about six or seven years old. But she started playing and singing here in a church here in Cotton Plant. They would actually set her on a piano and let her play and then sing there and just entertain people. But she, as most African Americans, started in a local church. So as a result of that, when she moved to Chicago as a child, she got in a bigger congregation and she had a different style than anybody else in terms of her singing. And as a result, she became very popular at an early age. And I think by the time she was 13 or 14 years old, uh, she was already uh, had acquired knowledge on uh, picking a guitar. With the Pentecostal denomination encouraging all to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, gospel music, a form of rhythmic and religious song rooted in the spiritual tradition of the African-American South, traveled north during the southern exodus of the 1920s. Another cotton plant musician that moved north during this time was William Bunch. William Bunch played both piano and guitar and was a huge influence in 1930s blues music, calling himself Petey Wheatstraw, the devil's son-in-law, and the high sheriff of hell. Bunch's devilish imagery and his ooh well well lyrical catchphrase was most famously adopted by Robert Johnson. I'm one of 13 great nephews of William Bunch, the artist professionally known as Petey Wheatstraw. Petey Wheatstraw was born December 21st, 1902 in Ripley, Tennessee. We believe the family moved to a small area called Bexton, Arkansas in 1915. It's farmland, country, and this is where Petey and his family worked and made a living, scratched out a living. When he was down south here in Arkansas, many of the white dignitaries would go and pick Petey Wheatstraw up, bring him to a barn dance where he would perform for white audiences with his piano or with the guitar. But that was his audience. That's how he became known throughout the Delta area, which I think helped elevate it his career, helped him get to the next level, not only just performing here locally, but allowed him to go up north to St. Louis, Chicago, where he really became a famous. Arkansas still had prominent division lines between cultures and race, a divide that would not truly begin to come together for another 50 years. It could be in this divide that pronounced musical genres came to solidify. One genre that appears during the 1920s is country music, a mix of ballads, blues, folk, and dance tunes, often played with guitar and fiddles. Patsy Montana was a pioneering female country music singer who was born Ruby Blevins on October 30, 1908 in Jesseville, near Hot Springs. Gosh! Raised on church songs, fiddle music, and the music of country star Jimmy Rogers, Patsy Montana moved to Los Angeles in 1930 to attend UCLA, where she studied violin, and within a year won a talent contest, yodeling and singing Jimmy Rogers songs, while gaining experience as an entertainer on radio stations. Country, folk, and blues began their musical introduction into the world at the same time as recorded audio and radio. <laughs> 